One of the most gruesome events in U.S. history took place by the hands of the LDS Church. This gruesome event was a massacre of 120 men, women, and children, and it was known as the Mountain Meadows Massacre. You may have heard of it. But this massacre wasn't committed, you know, by a rogue band of Mormons that decided to violently kill and destroy their enemies. No, not at all. The order to kill this group of immigrants that was passing through the Utah Territory came down from the top. That's right, it came down from top leaders in the LDS Church. And Joseph Smith's successor, Brigham Young, not only knew about the massacre, but actually tried to cover it up and blame the entire event on the Indians. In this video, I'm going to take you back in time to the year 1857, and I'm going to walk you through the events leading up to one of the worst and probably least known massacres that took place on U.S. soil. And I'm going to do that not just by telling you the story, but by showing you the full confession written in an early newspaper by the only man tried, convicted, and executed for the heinous crime. This man was John D. Lee, and he was a scapegoat, a patsy, a sacrificial lamb that the LDS Church blamed the entire murderous event on. But make no mistake about it, John D. Lee was not the only man to blame just because he was the only one tried and convicted. There was overwhelming evidence that the orders to kill these people came from the top leaders of the Mormon church. And this is not the only time the early Mormons committed violent crimes. There were others. And in this new video series, I'm going to show you other murderous crimes committed by early leaders of the Mormon church. For example, the violent crimes of the Danites. Now, the Danites were a group of Avengers that were nicknamed the Destroying Angels. And this group was, um, I don't know, sort of like a, maybe like a special ops group or something like that in the military. But their assignments included killing in cold blood non-Mormons, non-Mormons that the LDS church felt threatened by. Not only that, but they even killed their own people who tried to leave the Mormon church. And of course, they called it apostasy. And apostasy was a crime that was punishable by death. So in this series, I'm going to discuss um, the Danites. And we're going to also look at the tyranny of Brigham Young, the successor of Joseph Smith, and the man responsible for the doctrine of what was called blood atonement. We're not going to talk about that in this episode, but we will talk about Brigham Young's uh, teaching of blood atonement, which I am sure had a big part to play in the Mountain Meadows Massacre. So I'll be looking for these and other videos to come in this series. But for now, let's talk about the events that led to this gruesome crime. So, in September of 1857, a wagon train of immigrants known as the Baker Fancher Party, they were on their way from Arkansas to California. And as they passed through the Utah Territory, Utah wasn't a state at this time. It was strictly a ter territory, which, by the way, Brigham Young was the territory governor of uh, Utah. And uh, they were passing through the Utah Territory, and they decided to stop and refresh themselves and their cattle and their horses. And, and they did this at Mountain Meadows. And it wasn't long before the wagon train was attacked by Indians. Now, some sources say that the number of Indians was four to five hundred. I'm, I'm not sure, but uh, that is what some of the sources say. And the men of the Baker Fancher party were able to hold off the Indians by chaining some of the wagons in their train together in a circle to use, well, as a defense. Now, this enabled them to fight back, which they did for about five days. And during the battle... Um, I believe it was six of the immigrants that were killed, and at least 16 of the immigrants were uh, wounded. 
But the party, the uh, the party of immigrants also killed and wounded some Indians, too. So but little did these men and women know that it was the Mormons, the Mormons who had convinced the Indians to attack the party. And they were hoping that the Indians would do the job for them and just kill the entire band. Um, but it was made known to the Mormons that um, a few of the immigra- immigrants had um, might have seen some white men among the Indians and might have suspected that uh, the Mormons were involved in the Indian attack. And so there was a plan to kill all of the immigrants. That plan was put into motion by uh, the Mormons uh, to massacre them, to just go in and kill them. And the order to have these immigrants murdered came from a man by the name of Colonel Dame and another man by the name of Isaac Haight. Uh, these men were, um, uh, they were both senior regional leaders of the Mormon militia. And uh, it was actually John D. Lee, the one I mentioned earlier that was executed uh, for this heinous crime. He was in charge of raising up the Indians um, to attack the immigrants. And again, Lee is, Lee is the important figure here because it's going to be his story that I'm going to be showing you. It's going to be his confession uh, just days after his trial that was, uh, or after, I'm sorry, after his execution that was printed in the papers. Now, according to Lee, the Mormon leaders lied to him and they said that the train of immigrants were threatening to cause a lot of trouble. They were a large group, they said, of ruffians and troublemakers that um, once they got into California would spread the word and bring back others to do you know, you know, harm to the Mormon settlers. It was also said that um, there were some among the party that took part in the killing of Joseph and Hiram, Hiram Smith uh, at Carthage. So the quote in there, one of the quotes from this, um, this article that I'm going to be showing you, Um, Lee says that uh, he was told by the Mormon leaders, and I quote, there is not a drop of innocent blood among them. And that was by, actually, that was uh, Colonel Haight who said that. Now, it was agreed that the Mormons would deceive the immigrants. This is how the whole massacre took place. There were councils that were being held uh, before the uh, Mormons went in and slaughtered these men and women. And children, and um, it was it was agreed that they would deceive the immigrants, and this is how they're going to do it. They're going to fly a flag of truce and convince the immigrants to surrender. And they did that by promising them protection from the Indians if they would surrender their weapons and follow the Mormons out. Remember, they were they were in the meadows. They had their wagon trains uh, or their wagon uh, train in a circle almost, and and fighting using their wagon trains as a defense or their wagons as a defense. And um, so they promised these immigrants protection from the Indians if they would just surrender their weapons and follow them out. And waiting about a half a mile or so ahead was an ambush. The entire immigrant party was brutally slaughtered by the Mormons and the Indians. 120 men, women, and children were killed. The Mormons were sworn to secrecy by their leaders, including Brigham Young. And the penalty for telling anyone, even their own people, about what had happened, guess what that penalty was? If you guess death, you were, or you are, (laughs) you, you are right. So a letter was written to the government. And the Indians were blamed for the entire event. Let me take you over now to the actual article of the only man charged and convicted for this heinous crime, John D. Lee. All right. So before we actually look at the article from um, John D. Lee, the confession of John D. Lee, I want to show you that what I said is a fact that after this horrible massacre, the Mormons blamed the entire event on the Indians. Now, here's the, here's the rub of this whole thing. The, the irritating thing about this is it was 20 years later. 
20 years later before John D. Lee was convicted tri- or tried, convicted, and executed. So he was executed on March the, uh, the 23rd, 1877, 20 years after this, uh, this massacre. That's the rub. However, before he was even convicted, before it was, um, you know, it was found out that the Mormons were involved, everyone thought the Indians did it. So here is an old paper here from the Chicago Tribune um, dated November the 12th. Remember, this happened in September of 1857. So this is November of 1857. And um, this uh, this is actually uh, a correspondence uh, article coming from the Los Angeles, uh, from uh, Los Angeles, California. Um, but I just want to show you that they did think that the Mormons... Or, I'm sorry, that the Indians are the ones that actually did the killing. Uh, this is what the article says. I take this opportunity of informing you of the murder of an entire train of immigrants on their way from Missouri and Arkansas to this state via Great Salt Lake City, which took place according to the best information I can possibly acquire, which is primarily through Indians, at the mountain uh, meadows, which are at or near the rim of the Great Basin and some distance south of the most southern Mormon settlements between uh, the 10th and the 12th. It is absolutely one of the most horrible massacres I have ever had the painful necessity of relating. The company consisted of 130 or 185 men, women, and children, and including some 40 or 45 capable bearing arms, they were in possession of quite an amount of stock and so forth. We're not going to read the entire article, and the numbers there are wrong. It was, uh, according to every single article that I have read about the Mountain Meadows Massacre, every single article written in a book that I have on, the, on Mormonism, it has said 120. And even if you look at the Wikipedia article on it, I believe, if I'm correct, it says 120 Uh, men and women. So this is early on, and uh, the numbers here aren't correct. So as you can see here, we're in newspapers.com. This is the uh, New Northwest, dated April 6th, 1877. Not very shortly, remember, um, Lee was executed on March the 23rd, 1877. So this is very shortly after. Now, there is a book that you can get off of um, the Internet Archives, and it's called Mormonism Unveiled. It is the. It was actually written by Lee before he was executed. Um, uh, it's his life story, and then it's the confession in the back of the book. And so uh, you can get that off of. I'll leave the link to it, by the way, in the YouTube description, or, or try to remember to do that. If if I don't do that, put in the comments, "Hey, you were supposed to leave the link," and, and I'm, I'm sure I'll remember. But just in case. But anyway, you can find this book over at Internet Archives, and. It matches. This is the there's several articles in newspapers.com um, that talk about John D. Lee and talk about his execution and talk about his confession. But this is the closest to the book, and I think it's actually taken from uh, part of that book as well. But uh, let's go ahead and look at this confession. So hang with me, and uh, we're going to go through this article: Confession of John D. Lee, his story of the Mountain Meadow Massacre. It implicates Brigham Young. The following is the confession of John D. Lee, which appeared in the San Francisco Chronicle and New York Herald. Now, by the way, if you're thinking, if, if Robert E. Lee pops in your head, in this uh, article or in this book, Lee, John D. Lee, mentions that he is a relative of Robert E. Lee. So if, if that. Um, If that, if Robert E. Lee pops in your head. But anyway, P.O.C.A. Nevada, March 21st. After the sentence of death had been passed upon Lee in September 1876, he made a full confession in writing his participation in the mountain, uh, of his participation in the Mountain Meadows Massacre, which document um, he delivered to W.W. Bishop of P.O.C.A., one of his uh, counsel and directed him to have the same published after his execution. So let me start down here with the actual um, uh, testimony here. I married Agatha Ann Woosley in 1833 and moved to Fayette County, Illinois on Sucker Creek. 
There I became wealthy. In 1836, I became acquainted with some traveling Mormon preachers. I bought, read, and believed the Book of Mormon. I sold my property in Illinois and moved to far west in Missouri in 1837, where I joined the Mormon church and became intimately acquainted with Joseph Smith, Brigham Young. And then you can see here that the paper kind of folds over so you can't read that little bit. I was, and he was part or involved with the Danites at its first formation. And remember, the next video series I'm going to do is on this group of Avengers called the Danites. These were some violent men. And so um, I'm going to uh, be doing another video about these men specifically. Uh, the members of this order were solemnly sworn to obey all the orders of the priesthood of the Mormon church to do any and all things as commanded. The destroying angels, that was their nickname, of the Mormon church were selected from this organization. I took an active part as a Mormon soldier, as it was the uh, recurring conflicts between the people and the Mormons, which made Jackson County, Missouri, a historic ground. When the Mormons were expelled from Missouri, I was one of the first to settle in Nauvoo, in Illinois, where I took an active part in all that was done by the church or city. I had charge of the construction of many public buildings there and was a policeman a bodyguard of Joseph Smith at Nauvoo. After his death, I had the same position to Brigham Young, who succeeded Joseph as prophet, priest, and revelator in the church. I was recorder for the Quorum of Seventy, head clerk of the church, and organized the priesthood in the Order of Seventy. I took all the degrees of the endowment house and stood high in the priesthood. I traveled extensively throughout the United States as a Mormon missionary, and acted as trader and financial agent of the church. From the death of Joseph Smith until the settlement at Salt Lake City, I was one of the locating uh, committee that selected sites for various towns and cities in Utah Territory. And I held many offices in the territory and was a member of the Mormon legislature and was probate judge of Washington County, Utah. Immediately after Joseph Smith received the revelation concerning polygamy, I was informed of its doctrines by said Joseph Smith and the apostles. I believed in the doctrine and have been sealed to 18 women. Okay. Uh, if I remember correctly, and I don't remember if he mentions that in this article, but if I remember correctly, reading about him, he had over 60 children. I think it was 64 to be exact. 60 children. Just, uh, that just blows my mind. This absolutely blows my mind. Um, I was honored. I was an honored man in the church, uh, or I'm sorry, I was sealed to the, um, well, let me go back here. Uh, I believe in the doctrine and have been sealed to 18 women, three of whom sisters and one was the mother of three of my wives. I was sealed to this old woman for her soul's salvation. I was on, I was an honored man in the church, flattered and regarded by Brigham Young and the Apostles until 1868 when I was cut off from the church and selected as a scapegoat to suffer and bear the sin of my people. Now it's messed up right here. I'm going to do the best I can. As a duty to myself and mankind, I now confess all that I did at the Mountain Meadows Massacre without animosity to anyone, shielding none, and giving the facts as they existed. Those with me at that time were acting under orders from the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. So the massacre took place as a result of orders from the top down. The horror deeds then committed were done as a duty which we believed we owed to God and our church. We were all sworn to secrecy before uh, and after the massacre. The penalty for giving information concerning it was death, as I am to suffer death for what I did and have been betrayed both by those who gave uh, orders to act and those who were the most active of my assistants. I now give the world the true facts as they exist and tell why the massacre was committed and who were the active participants. The Mountain Meadows Massacre was the result of the direct teachings of Brigham Young. And again, one of the teachings of Brigham Young was the doctrine of blood atonement, but we will get to that in a later video. 
Uh, so the Mountain Meadows Massacre was the result of the direct teachings of Brigham Young, and it was done by order of those high in authority in the Mormon community. The immediate order for the massacre was issued by Colonel Dame, Lieutenant Colonel Isaac Haight, and a council of Mormons at Cedar City, Utah. I held no position either in the civil or military department in the church at that time. About September 7th, I went to Cedar City where I met Isaac Haight, president um, or, or governor of that state of Zion, and also lieutenant colonel of the Iron County Mormon Militia. This was uh, Sunday. Lieutenant Colonel Haight was the leader in all things concerning civil ch church and military matters. It was a crime punishable by death to disobey his orders. Lieutenant Colonel Haight gave me a full account of the immigrants who were coming. We slept in the Iron Works all that night and arranged our plans. Lieutenant Colonel Haight said that the immigrants were a rough set and they were bad men, robbers, and murderers, and helped to kill the Missouri prophets. I believed him. I was ordered to raise an Indian band to attack their train and to run off their cattle and to have the Indians kill the immigrants. I sent Carl Schertz, my son-in-law, to raise a band of southern Indians. Nephi Johnson went to the other tribes. On Monday morning, I left the ironworks to obey my orders. Lieutenant Colonel Haight said, quote, we are setting by orders. It is all right. We will let the Indians bear all the blame, end quote. I said, quote, we are forbidden to shed innocent blood, end quote. The reply of hate was, there is not a drop of innocent blood in the whole lot. Carry out the instructions of those in authority. If you are dutiful in this, you are. Our, your reward shall be great in the kingdom of God, for God will bless those who obey our counsels and make all things fit for the people of the Lord in their days. On the way home, I passed by many Indians out on the warpath. I promised to join them the next day. On Tuesday morning, the Indians attacked the train just at daylight and killed seven and wounded 16 immigrants. The Indians lost some of their warriors. The immigrants then fortified their position, and the Indians surrounded them and sent for me. The whole, uh, the whole country was roused, both whites and Indians rushing to Mountain Meadows from all directions. I arrived at the camp late on Tuesday and found the Indians in large force. They demanded that I should lead the attack. I refused until orders were received going up top here, from Hate or Dame. I went south 10 miles, met the whites and Indians coming from the south and camped there that night. On Wednesday, I went to the, meadow, uh, to the meadows and sent a man to Cedar City for further orders. On Thursday, the orders came by Major Higby. There were 58 whites and about 500 Indians there then. Major Higby made a speech. He said the immigrants were to be killed. Those who could talk must get them out of their fortification, fortifications by treachery. I was to follow the flag of truce, make a treaty, promise protection, get the arms of the immigrants, and put the sick and wounded and the children in the wagons. Then the trains under Higby would meet the immigrants. The Indians were to be in ambush. The immigrant women were to go ahead and the Indians in ambush were to kill the women, and the militia were to kill the men. I and the drivers of the wagons were to kill the wounded and sick that were in the wagons. The others made speeches. Then we had a prayer circle. Then more speeches were made, and it was agreed by all, par all parties that it was the will of God for us to do as ordered. On Friday morning, the immigrants had a white flag flying. The brethren were again assembled. Speeches were made by all willing to act. There were present Major John M. Higby, Philip K. Smith, Bishop of the Church at Cedar City, Joel White, William C. Stewart, Benjamin Arthur, Alexander uh, Wilden, Charles Hopkins, Tate, Ira, Allen, Robert Willie, Richard Harrison, 
Samuel Pollock, Daniel McFarlane, John Err, and some of these other names I can't read because of this crease here in the paper. John Jacobs, E. Curtis, uh, Cartwright, William Bateman, Anthony Stratton, A. Loveridge, Joseph Clues, John Durfee, Columbus Freeman, and others making 54 or 58 whites and about 400 or 500 Indians. Major Higby said, Brethren, it is the order of the president that all the immigrants must be put out of the way. President Haight has counseled with Colonel Dame and has orders from him to put all the immigrants out of the way. All must be killed that can talk. By the way, I forgot to mention that uh, there were some who did survive this massacre. And those who did survive the massacre were children that were um, that couldn't talk, babies, infants, and children, I believe, that were under seven years of age. So I think there were 16 to 17 uh, surviving children of this massacre. Some of them were badly injured. They were taken to Mormon homes and uh, they were cared for until they were picked up by the government and, and uh, taken to their, uh, their families. Um, so, forgot to mention that. So let me start here again. The order of the president that all the immigrants must be put out of the way. President Haight has counseled with Colonel Dame and has orders from him to put all the immigrants out of the way. All must be killed that can talk. Again, he gave the bad character of the immigrants. The church authorities of Southern Utah were all there and were acting as a church council for the sake of Christ. We were then told, we are here to do the duty we owe God, the church, and the people. The orders of those in authority are are that all immigrants that can talk must die. Our orders are from our leaders who speak with inspired tongues, and their words are the will of God. You have no right to question. Read that again. And their words are the will of God. You have no right to question. You must obey as commanded. The flag of truth sent was carried by William Bateman. He was met halfway by the uh, immigrants. They held a parley. And when Bateman returned, he said the immigrants would surrender their arms and do as requested. The soldiers marched out within 200 yards of the immigrants. I took the wagons, went to the camp, and stated the orders. They said they would surrender and would put their arms and the sick and wounded and children into wagons. They were burying their dead men, those who had died in um, in the Indian attack previously. The immigrants were in tears. They feared treachery. The wagons were loaded and started. The immigrants went in single file, the women and large children ahead. When the men and women and the wagons were half a mile from the starting place, the firing commenced. The Indians killed the women and large children. The Mormons killed the men. The drivers with me killed the sick and wounded. We saved 17 children. The dead were stripped, mutilated, and left on the field. We buried the dead and drove the cattle to Iron Springs. The wagons and other property were sold in Cedar City by order of the church authorities. Now, there were some reports that this wagon train of immigrants had just thousands and thousands of dollars, uh, just tons of goods and all that with them, but um, there's no real evidence of that. And, and, um, and that you know that the Mormons took it and dispersed it among themselves, but there's no there's no evidence to that at all. Um, there were some cattle I think that were that were sold to some of the Mormons, but I think that as far as I can, as far as I've seen in my own research, that's all that uh, that's all that took place. Um, the order the orders were fully uh, obeyed. The horrors of the massacre were beyond description. The brethren were sworn to secrecy. This was done by order of the church. Then at war with the government. George A. Smith, second in the priesthood, had just been there giving orders. He visited the Indian camp with me. He came to instruct the people and uh, let none go through without a pass from young Dame or Haight uh, not to sell the immigrants food, grain, or anything. 
He said the Americans were a, ro- a mob of ruffians from the president down. He asked if the Indians would kill the bad immigrants. I told him the Indians had and Mormons were both hostile to and would kill all not under the protection of the church. That this pleased him. He laughed and said, all right. Hayton Dame told him the same. He taught uh, the people that it was their duty to kill the immigrants, massacre them just as Smith and the leaders wanted it. Hate sent me to Salt Lake to report to Brigham Young. Now watch this. And promised me a crown of celestial of celestial reward for what I had done. I went and made a report to Young ten days after the massacre. Told him all, everything, who were there and who were the guilty, who were active in the killing, all I knew. I said, sustain us or release us from the endowment oath to avenge the death of the prophets. Brigham Brigham Young said, I will communicate with God. I went back next morning and Brigham Young said, Brother Lee, not a drop of innocent blood was shed. So so Brigham Young tells Lee, I'm going to communicate with God to find out if if this was right or wrong. So he goes and he supposedly talks to God and God tells Brigham Young, this is <laughs> this is the Brigham Young that uh, uh, Brigham Young Univers- of Brigham Young University. This this is the Mormon leader, right? The uh, right after Joseph Smith, a successor of Joseph Smith, and he is saying, after supposedly conversing with God, that not a drop of innocent blood was shed. And this is what he says, I have gone to God in prayer and God has shown me that it was, that it was a just act. Look at that. God has shown me it was a just act. The people did right. Only they were a little too hasty. So that's all. It was a just act. There wasn't one drop of innocent blood in that party. And it was right to do. The only thing that was wrong was, you know, they were a little too hasty. I have evidence from God that the act was just, that it was a that it was in in accord with God's will. I sustain you and the brev- brethren in all you did. That was that was Brigham Young. Brigham Young. All I fear is treachery on the part of the brethren. Go home, tell the brethren I sustain them, and keep all as secret as the uh, as the grave. Never tell anyone. Now watch this. Here it is. Write me a letter laying the blame on the Indians. I will report it to the United States as an Indian massacre. So Brigham Young the supposed prophet of the Mormon church, successor of Joseph Smith, was a murderer and a liar and a false prophet, of course, and many other things, and, a, and, a, and a, an adulterer. I mean, the, the, this is, and, and I know that many Mormons wouldn't say he was an adulterer, but the man was involved in polygamy and uh, divorce and other things, and, and we'll talk about that when we get to Brigham Young. Young was then, and for years after, fully satisfied with me and my acts. He gave me three wives after that, and afterward appointed me probate judge of Washington County. Nothing but cowardice has made him desert me now. Fifty head of cattle were sold in Salt Lake City by the authorities of, for merchandise. The immigrants had 450 or 500 head of cattle, but little money. When... Uh, Cradle Ball, judge in Utah, went to the Meadows to investigate the massacre. Young came with him. He, Young, then knew all about the massacre. He held a meeting of the brethren and preached at Cedar City. He said about the immigrants, do you know who they were? I will tell you. They were the fathers, mothers, brothers, sisters, um, uncles, aunts, and children of the men who killed the saints in Jackson County and afterwards killed the prophets in the Carthage jail. And who were the prophets in the Carthage jail? 
That would be Joseph and Hiram Smith. Their children are now in the poorhouse. Their relatives refuse them protection because they are the children of thieves, outlaws, and murderers. Let me move uh, move the article up here. I've been told there are many brethren willing to inform on those who did this thing. I hope there is no truth in this. I hope no such person lives. If there is, I tell you what your fate will be. Unless you repent at once and keep secret all you know and protect each other, you will die a dog's death. Let me hear no more treachery among my people. Anyone who would have proved the traitor then would have met the destroying angel at once. And again, the destroying angel is another nickname for the Danites, and we'll be talking about that um, in the next video. After I had reported to Young, I went home, met Hate, and gave him a full report of Young's statement. Hate said, well done, good and faithful servant. You shall have a celestial reward for your services. You have deserved well of God and the church. I next went to work to write an account of the massacre, laying uh, the blame on the Indians. I wrote a long letter, the same that uh, the, the same that been produced in evidence against me. Look at this. Brigham Young knew it was false and written to save the Mormon church. His report to the government was a part of a plan to save the Mormons from blame. It was years after before I knew it had been made. I had been made a tool by the leaders. I only obeyed the orders of my superiors. I then believed I was serving God and would receive a celestial reward. Now I know it was wrong and that my reward is not to be celestial. And I do hope that uh, someone presented Lee the gospel because the Mormons do not have the gospel. I hope someone told John D. Lee that Christ, even though that this was such a heinous, horrific crime, that Christ bled and died even for what Lee had done and for what all the, uh, all the Mormon leaders had done. But I hope someone came and told Lee that Christ died for him, rose for him, and that uh, if he would repent and place his faith in Christ, then uh, all would be well there at his execution. He would, um, he would truly enter into eternal life, not eternal death. I really do hope that someone came and shared the, the genuine gospel with Lee. I don't know if anyone did or did. There's a picture that I took off of the internet. Um, I think it was at, on Wikipedia that shows. Uh, I blew it up, and it shows Lee sitting there by his uh, by his coffin um, right before uh, the execution. It was an actual photograph, and so uh, I really do hope that someone came uh, and gave the gospel to Lee. Uh, anyway, so I kind of got off track there. Uh, let me see where I'm at. Uh, da, 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 da. Um, now I know it was wrong. Now I know it was wrong, and that my reward is not to be celestial. It was the first plan to have none but the Indians take part in the massacre. But as William C. Stewart, Joe White, and Benjamin Arthur were coming to the uh, meadows Wednesday morning, they met young Aiden and another um, something. Can't read it because of the crease there. Uh, Cedar City for help. Um, Looks like Indian attack and asked aid from the settlers. The only reply was a shot from Stewart, which wounded Aiden. The other men who was uh, wounded by White and Arthur escaped and carried word to the immigrants that the whites had uh, come to help the Indians. After this, the authority said there was no safety except in killing all who could talk. William C. Stewart was the most bloodthirsty of anyone there. He cut throats just for amusement. Uh, Klingon Smith, the bishop at Cedar Hill, 
or, or at Cedar, killed a man. Everyone there took part in the killing as a religious duty. We were then in the midst of the excitement of the Reformation, and we believed by the teaching of our leaders that the fullness of time had come, that the Mormons were to conquer the world and at once inherit the wealth of the universe. Christ was to come and rule 1,000 years, and Mormon doctrines were to be universally accepted. We were the followers of false teachers. Well, at least he admit, he admits that, and that is a good thing. That is a you know, and that's why I say I, I I read his testimony. I really do hope someone came and uh, talked to him about Christ. Um, we were the followers of false teachers. I have fallen a victim to the foolish and wicked men that I believed almost divine. I have had eighteen wives, and eleven of them have been divorced from me by Brigham Young. Three still remain true to me and have clung to me during my imprisonment. I am, uh, yes, here it is. I am the father of 64 children. Ten are dead. 54 are still living. The witnesses on my trial have not told the whole truth. They are all guilty of helping to kill the immigrants. This is the only act of violence I ever took part in except in lawful battle. I would not have uh, I would not have acted on that occasion had I not believed I was obeying the orders from the heads of the church. I knew I was doing according to the teachings of the priesthood, and I still think hate had his order from the heads of the church. My journals and private writings have all been destroyed by order of Brigham Young to give the account of the, fool, of the foul deeds done in God's name during the years when Brigham Young was chief and ruler in Utah. I know that many more murders um, and robberies committed by order of the priesthood, all of which I have fully stated in my writings delivered to my attorney, W.W. W. Bishop. I've told the whole truth. And the God I am soon to meet face to face knows my assertions are nothing but the truth. And uh, so, anyway, um, one of the things that uh, you'll see as you begin to read, uh, if you get if you download this book from um, Internet Archive and you read it, you'll see that um, uh, Lee was not very willing, or at least at least that's what he says. So if you read that book, you'll see uh, what Lee was doing. He was actually trying to stop it in, 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 a, in a sense. He was, he, was, he was speaking out against it at these councils. Um, this article doesn't say that, but at least in the, uh, in the book he was. 